happening more in the zone outside the buffer zone inside the containment and buffer zone the activities are much much limited so in case but even though the activities are limited any person who is accessing healthcare in the covid or non covid hospitals is being may be provided sanitary napkins on request but provided the risk to the health is not there so that is what we are and this uh, and as i as you all are aware and most of you know that these guidelines are very fluid we are changing every week something new which we are learning the world is learning so these guidelines are apt to change maybe next week or next week we have you know more more interventions or greater access so that yes that's it. that is the kind which we are doing right now okay so i yeah, thank you very much for that i am sure panelists and participants will have a lot of questions for you but we'll come back to that um now i'd like to introduce dr namdita palshekar namdita has been the past president of foxi which is the federation of gynecologists um, and obstetricians society of india and currently she is the president of this association in mumbai um she's an ivf specialist and she heads the department at the leelawati hospital in bombay and my question to you dr nandita is in your experience what's the current status of research and evidence in india on the association between unhygienic menstrual practices and the risk of reproductive tract infections what do we know and what are the gaps in our knowledge over to thank you sir five minutes sir thank you ina good afternoon everybody i think it's a very relevant question because when we are promoting menstrual hygiene it's very important to know that if it is not maintained what can happen and i think there are a lot of studies today and in fact one particular study i would like to mention is from orissa that's very much from my indian population including the rural and the urban girls and it has been shown that menstrual hygiene if it is not good then they get infections infections like candidia bacterial vaginosis trichomonas vaginalis etc these are simple infections you know and these are because of the <clears throat> hygiene not being maintained and lactobacillus which is deprived so our indian diet you know if i don't know if we can uh, coax them to have more curds etc these kind of foods that is also important <clears throat> and maintaining menstrual hygiene is really important most of the studies have shown that if you don't uh, you know control this infections they can lead to problems especially in pregnancy you can have pre term birth infections small babies etc otherwise you can have pelvic inflammatory disease which means that the whole genital system is blocked and you can actually have infertility because of that and of course the infections also make them more prone to sexually uh, transmitted diseases so these are some of the bad effects of menstrual hygiene leading to infections but if you look at uh, our country i think there are 336 million women in india to our, today who are menstruating and each woman on an average has say 65 days of periods and i look at it very differently you know madam was talking about menstrual pads and all so 33 million pads are deposited every day so i think we all together especially the covid environment you know it has been made us more uh, open to green we realize the amount of um, you know pollution and everything that we are causing so i think this is the right time to uh, convert our girls this is the gap that i feel that we should promote uh, reusable pads you know the cloth pads or the biodegradable pads the second is the menstrual cup actually it is the simplest very easy uh, and a very clean if the girls are taught about hygiene how to use it or not and there was a meta analysis you know which is a, a study of many uh, patients like 3000 plus patients which actually said that if the girls are taught properly menstrual cup does not cause any problems so i think those are the things that we can really look at and if you look at the gaps which i find basically a girl has to be taught she should be treated with dignity i think we have a lot of cultural social problems so dignity and uh, you know discomfort of fear that she does not feel scared to tell people that she's got a period i think those are the uh, 
points that we must hit home and uh, like restricted behavioral patterns or expectations that are there and of course you know the physical environment our um, prime minister has gone out of his way to create toilets and all etc but i think that's very very important when you want menstrual hygiene because not only providing sanitary pads and napkins but also for them to clean wash you know do body washes it's not only wearing the napkin so all these i think are very important and should be addressed and of course uh, i think what soya ji has said perfectly well that uh, handling the mhm during emergency situations is extremely important and i'm so happy to know that the ashas and the uh, you know are going that last mile and providing a uh, uh hygiene products to the girls because in school normally we get them you know in mumbai the municipality has installed uh, sanitary vending machines in every school and they get a coin and they get those pads but now since they are sitting at home they will have this problem and i'm so happy to know that this is being taken care of thank you eena thank you nandita that was really insightful and very useful to know those connections um i'm moving on now to miss nidhi goyal nidhi is the founder and executive director of the non profit called rising flame and rising flame is dedicated to the recognition protection and promotion of the human rights of people living with disabilities especially women and young people with disabilities Uh, Nidhi is a feminist activist. She's been living with disability, working for disability rights, and for gender justice. She's done a, a range of work with um, with national and global organizations on rights, on disability rights, and on human rights or with human rights organizations. And she, her goal is to influence so that systems may change, so that policies may change, and so that discourses may change. to be much more rights focused and uh, nidhi has worked she's been appointed by the un women executive directors civil society advisory group she's on that group um she is been uh, invited on the multi stakeholder steering committee of the generation equality forum she sits on the advisory board of voice she's been globally elected to the board of association for women's rights in development where she is currently the president and in india nidhi has been invited to be a member of the core group on persons with disabilities and elderly persons as part of the national human rights commission and she has also been invited to represent diversity and to be um, invited to the diversity and inclusion task force of fiki so that's very wide ranging experience and set of influences nidhi we would like to ask you how can women and girls with disabilities be included in menstrual health management programs and when we say included can you also please speak about what inclusion actually means thank you nidhi Nidhi is your Nidhi can't hear you is your microphone on mute or is it just me that can't hear No we can't hear no, but I think the mic is on mute Yeah can you hear me now Nidhi you Yes, this is okay. Thank no, you so I, I much. No, I guess uh, turning on and off my microphone. There's some issue within the settings. That's absolutely fine. So, okay. um, I think I'm still so. Thank you so much for the uh, introduction, and thank you for having me here. Um, I just wanted to say a couple of things that when we think about inclusion, uh, maybe it's time to. And and I know it's, we are in the current pandemic situation, and we wanted to. um we want to set systems in place right now and ensure that there is no breakages in the uh, breakage in the linkages of systems or or the linkages or the supply chains or availability etc what really is uh, important to understand the, what inclusion means for women and girls with disabilities is to see um one what barriers exist um and two if there's sort of 
facilitating. We've lost you again. I'm very clear. Hello? Hello? Okay, Hello? go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. So, um, the, the point to see is that if we have the system to facilitate in a way that we're overcoming these environmental barriers. So to give you a couple of examples, when we're talking about menstrual health management programs, uh, first of all, how do women and girls with disabilities even get an information around these programs, right? Um, are, is our communication happening in accessible formats? Do we understand what accessible formats mean? So for example, if we launch a video campaign or if we launch an image campaign, where, where, which we often do on Twitter, on social media, uh, otherwise through posters, etc. Um, we do not think about how blind girls would access this kind of information and how, and when I say we, it's not the group here. I mean, in, in general, talking about yeah, yeah. menstrual health management and the programming around that, right? Um, so thinking through what access needs would mean just starting from communication would really help. Um, in designing inclusive just campaigns, outreach methods, um, when we're giving information around menstrual management, right? Um, is it in an easy to read language? So a language that probably girls or women with intellectual disabilities could understand. That would be a very concrete way to include them uh, within any kind of uh, within any kind of discussion or programming per se. Um, another very crucial thing would be to think about to really destigmatize women with disabilities themselves and their existence. So um, it really comes. It's very deeply linked with SRHR, the Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights, because for women with disabilities, they're generally considered asexual. Um, they're considered not to have uh, bodily autonomy or the ability to consent. And as a result, what ends up happening is that in any kind of destigmatizing outreach messaging or programming that we do, so we do a lot of destigma around or combating stigma around menstruation per se, um, but we do not uh, combine that with a destigmatizing of, but my body is mine, I could take decisions. As a result, what happens is many parents and many doctors, they, although they're not allowed, are sort of recommending post hysterectomies for um, girls with intellectual disabilities. And this came up the first time in 1994, and this continues up until today. Um, the practice of post hysterectomy on girls living with intellectual disabilities is a form of menstrual management, right? So parents who, you know, particularly women who are high support needs, their parents are a Wise by medical professionals, many medical professionals, and I won't say all because that's not true. Um, around sort of uh, taking these steps um, to have a forced hysterectomy to have a better menstrual support, or or not to have to provide the menstrual support. Um, so inclusion would really for women and girls with disabilities, in, and particularly in the current pandemic. So if we already start and put these systems in place where our outreach and information both are accessible first. Um, the second that we're working on the stigma around women and girls with disabilities, their ability to consent, their bodily integrity, and their sexual and reproductive health and rights. And the third, if we specifically understand in the current context, this is already a preparation where we need to not fi fire fight Nidhi, when... Nidhi, I'm sorry. Nidhi, yeah, I'm going to interrupt you. We lost you for a few moments. Can you just repeat the last point you were making? Correct. So I was saying, thank you. Before the pandemic already, if we thought of two things that we could do properly around Nidhi? access to information. Can you, hi, can you guys hear me? I'm going to... Okay, I'm turning my camera off. Is this more stable? Hello? Yes, we, we can hear yeah. Nidhi. Okay, yes, so I've turned my camera off so that was causing the unstability of the network. Um, I'm just quickly going you to, hear me? I think, summarize because I'm eating to other people's time. No, Nikki, please take your time. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so I, I wanted to say that Go ahead. Before, before the pandemic hits, if in our general programming, if we keep two things in mind, one is access to information and having an accessible outreach when it comes to menstrual management. And the second, to work around stigma on women and girls with disabilities when it comes to their bodily integrity, when it comes to their ability to consent, when it comes to their sexual and reproductive health overall. Um, if we think of these two things, we'll be in a much better place 
to respond when the pandemic hits. Now, the specific things that happen around when such a pandemic hit, hits is we all have access crunches, which means that we're not, you know, there are containment zones where people are not allowed to leave their buildings or apartments or stalls or whatever else it is. But even if they're allowed, our infrastructure is so inaccessible that women and girls with disabilities are very often unable to reach a chemist store by themselves. And menstruation is such a subject in this country that you really can hardly tell your father or brother who's going to buy a medicine that why don't you get me a sanitary pad? So really thinking through stigma around menstruation, but also linking it very deeply with access um, in the current pandemic for blind women like me or for women on wheelchairs, just stepping out without assistance or stepping out on roads and infrastructures that are not accessible is not an option. As a result, so I'd like to mention here Rising Flame, my organization is conducting in collaboration with Sightsavers, a research around women and girls with disabilities in the current pandemic. Um, and so the some of the outcomes have been where women are not getting access to, in MP and Chhattisgarh, not getting access to sanitary wear. So they're forced to use cloth, which in a way environmentally could be justified. But what happens again is that you hardly have the ability to wash your clothes if you're you have a limb deformity or a locomotor disability as it is called you don't have the capability to wash the cloth on your own as a result you do not get assistance because menstrual uh, menstrual cloth you use cloth will not be washed they cannot walk a proper distance to dry it etc um so just unavailability of menstrual hygiene products could be a huge challenge and the second thing is just really um how to even get there so i think the inclusion would mean sort of thinking of access and stigma together uh, or accessibility and stigma together to think of overall and full access of women with disabilities to to menstrual health and menstrual health management at these points sorry for the cracking of networks but I i'll just come to a close here i'm happy to further uh, add in the discussions thank you very much nidhi thank you helped us to unpack both kinds of discrimination against people who live with disabilities as well as the who's come together in the lives of people uh, in to Tejra. Rublin is Director of Programs at the YP Foundation. She's a feminist development professional and an activist, and she's done more, year, more than eight years of work with grassroots feminist organizations and advocacy research spaces. Her work has involved training and research and policy advocacy, as well as program management, and with a focus on youth-based programming at the community level. She is a member of Global Unite Youth Network, and she's played a key role in designing, piloting, testing, and regional training of the toolkit that was developed for young practitioners on gender-based violence. The question that we have for you, Prabhu, is that, um, you know, there are a number of programs um, related to SRHR education for young people that often get limited to menstrual health education. Can you share some examples and approaches in the past or some ideas for the future where the menstrual health discussion is not the end point? but it becomes the beginning for a deeper discussion on sexual health and reproductive health and rights. Over to you, Prabhupada. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hina. And thank you, Nidhi, for uh, bringing home some very resonating uh, points around uh, right, uh, rights and stigma-free work. Uh, and I think, let me just begin uh, by seeing that menstruation and sexual and reproductive education in our country especially uh, have been issues that have seen rel uh, seen their relevance in national and global commitments uh, that the country has made. But unfortunately, they have faced all forms of backlash uh, to be able to have a comprehensive approach. Uh, till date, we do not have a lack of any clear policy mandate uh, that invests that we can invest in this kind of an education. There is a 
clear sort of lack of uh, in, uh, investment that happens when it comes to mitigation of any form of backlash on uh, behavioral change communication material uh, to address misconceptions or sustaining even a strong position on comprehensively addressing all curriculum topics uh, of under CSE and not like cherry picking uh, or repackaging them uh, in the name of life skills. Uh, and just also more importantly, uh, drawing from the unfortunate reinforcement of binary and heteronormative understanding of issues of relationships which automatically then excludes young people who do not identify within the same uh, and uh, with that I think what is really we're trying to see is that with the global health community there has been a conversation that we need to use the transition to adolescent as a window of opportunity to provide information on bodily changes I'm sure most of us even here who started our menstruation quite early in our ages, we don't have the most fond memories of the first uh, menstruation. Uh, it is this burden of the same stigma, the social taboo and the patriarchal norms that then have used that episode in our lives as an onset to further widen the gap of access to information and right to decision making. There have been situations where adolescent girls are forced in transactional sex to obtain money for sanitary pads, something that Nidhi touched upon of the kind of uh, gap that has happened with menstruators not being able to talk to, the fa to their families to procure uh, menstrual management products during lockdown and also just because of the social stigma and unperturbed silence in families. Uh, the supply chain getting affected in the in the recent pandemic all of this I think the point really to draw is that menstruation is not a women's health issue it is an issue of bodily right and dignity in the CSC curriculums that we've had at YP our sessions have very specifically the attempt has been to talk about menstruation to provide comprehensive explanation because for we feel that menstruation regulation is a key to sexual and reproductive self-determination. It is critical for program interventions to understand that a co concept cannot be abstracted from its menu and that it is important to hand over complete control of information as one's right. We provide conceptual clarity therefore from erection, ejaculation, sex, menstruation as contingent on comprehensive knowledge of one's sexual autonomy and that I think should be a prerequisite for all adolescent focused programs. I think one key thing that happens in menstrual health education and counseling work is that they often limit and rightly uh, as you were pointing out in the question that they often limit to conversations around supplies uh, and maybe further to hygiene. I think what really should happen is we sh must start integrating those with conversations around pregnancies, contraceptives, STIs, RTIs uh, and abortion counselling because it is about pro-choice and pro-rights uh, because it is an issue of dignity uh, and equity uh, and empowering adolescents and young people with information about their bodies can only help increase their confidence and improve their communication skills so that it gives them the tool to articulate their consent and report violations without fear of not being believed or not being heard. Uh, and I believe that's also our collective vision too. So, yeah. Over to you, Ina. Okay. Thank you so much, Prableen. Uh, there were some gaps in what I heard heard um, because of my connection. Um, looking for the time, I'm going to first take some questions from the audience and uh, then we will take it from there. Uh, there are two questions for Nandita. Nandita, COVID spreads, can COVID spread through the vagina? Not, the question is not about whether it can spread through sex, but just while using menstrual products like cups and pads, can it spread? Can it go through our hands to the surface of these products and inside our bodies? This is one question. And a second question for you is that, is there any health impact of commercial sanitary pads which are available in the market as it includes bleaching chemicals and does SAP affect our vagina? 
So, Nandita, could you take those two questions, please? Okay. Thank you, Ina. I think those are very relevant questions. Uh, the first one is, is COVID infective? Now, COVID is a virus which is transmitted to uh, aerosol, you know, through particles for months. Mm -hmm. So if you are COVID positive or you have touched a surface which has COVID, on it it can get transported onto different surfaces but what that's why what is important is hand wash hand hygiene is very important so when you are opening these products when you are using these products it's very important to hand wash your hand hygiene now all the studies so far on pregnant women delivery etc have shown that covid virus is not seen in the vaginal secretion at least so far whatever we have Yes, there are studies which are showing that semen contains 15% of the patients who are positive may contain uh, uh, the RNA by, uh, the RNA of the virus in their sperm sample. But so far, we have very limited data on uh, you know, sexual transmission of COVID virus. There's absolutely no data regarding that. So I think you have to maintain hand hygiene because that's the way you can trans, uh, you know, put the fomites onto your menstrual hygiene products. So hygiene is going to be part of it. Uh, what was your second question? Uh, uh -huh, was about allergy pads. Yeah. Commercial uh, products. You know, I have been uh, very, very actively involved with the menstrual cup right now. I'm working with a lot of NGOs and all that. And today, uh, I'm supposed to make some, uh, you know, I was reading about the environment also, how these products uh, contain a lot of uh, endocrine disruptors that's the new thing that is there now and these endocrine uh, disruptors can actually enter your body uh, it's a kind of a pollution which can cause uh, you know uh, infertility lots of problems cancers male infertility etc etc so i think basically uh, we have to find a, our products are uh, organic that they can they don't contain these uh, you know products which can give rise to these endocrine dis uh, disruptors which go in the soil see when a pad is put in the soil it takes 6 months for that pad to dissolve in that soil and then the plastic never dissolves. So all these things have to be taken into mind. You know, I'm a modern woman. I've always used, I would prefer as a personal thing, take, use and throw it away. You know, dispose it because I don't want to keep handling it. But I think it's time that we uh, realize what we're doing to our environment, what we are creating, the pollution. And maybe, you know, uh, because we are one third, uh, that menstruating women are one third to one fourth of the population of the world. And we need to really contribute our bit towards uh, create our carbon footprint. Okay. Um, thank you for that, Nandita. And actually, in the process, you have answered one other question, which was about whether there is going to be a demand for products which are sustainable alternatives and environmentally friendly. So the big response to that is yes, definitely. Yeah. Ina, also one point I really want to stress over here, you know, when I was the president of Foxy, we had created uh, uh, guidelines for contraception uptake. You know, contraception is very important as uh, I think the previous speaker, she's talked about gender discrimination. Our women don't have the right, the husbands come and make the choice. So that is there. And I believe that a bouquet of contraception should be offered to the woman or a bouquet of menstrual, anything. I mean, she should be given a choice of which to accept because however poor or rich she, she is, she has a right, as we said, it's a menstrual uh, hygiene right. It's a right of a woman to be able to be accessed and then she can decide which is better for her you know like what we were talking about girls asking their brothers and their fathers i think if they had the menstrual cup they don't need to do all that you know they can just wash it maintain it clean it in the silic and these cups don't even need any uh, sterilizing or anything just plain washing with uh, soap and water so of course it creates a problem in those situations where uh, we don't have uh, water and hygienic conditions. But I think 
a bouquet should be offered to all women i mean i am very happy the government is going out of the way to provide pads and all but i think we are in the next step now the government is doing a lot of work and i really appreciate that the next step would be to offer a variety of choices to the women thank you okay thank you so much nandita uh, there is one question now to unfpa so i am going to ask shobna uh to please address that it had come up in a previous discussion um uh, in one of the previous webinars about the inclusion of uh, sanitary products in the time of crisis so uh, shobna can you take that question please yes uh, thank you ina so the question was whether uh, there is inclusion of uh, menstrual products and distribution of menstrual products during uh, crisis situations such as what we are facing right now Uh, so yes uh, to some extent there is uh, in previous crisis situations as part of ms unfpa uh, ms response that unfpa uh, supports we have been including uh, distribution of uh, menstrual hygiene products which have largely been in the form of uh, sanitary pads um, for affected communities uh, such as the cyclone that we saw in orissa last year or previously with kerala now uh, the uh, in the current situation uh, this has not been followed uh, in terms of an inter agency response but uh, there have been individual uh, civil society led uh, responses that have included uh, the distribution of sanitary pads other than that as uh, dr zoya mentioned in the beginning of this discussion the government yes has included it as part of the guidelines for rm and chi uh and it is very much there in uh, the government's response but a lot more needs to be done as we've heard also in the previous panels in terms of the disruption in the supply chain that has taken place and women and girls access to these services is something that requires more urgent attention and it will require more than uh, individual efforts by um, civil society organizations it requires greater push we do recognize that thank you Thank you, Shobna. There are two questions for Zoya. Zoya, one question is: How can we enhance focus on generating safety data for the basket of products, whether it's sanitary pads or menstrual cups? And is that something that might be of interest, for example, to the health ministry? And the second question for you is that uh, areas that are containment zones, how is it that we can get products to those areas? particularly and safely and you know is there a possibility of breaking this taboo that men can't be asked to either bring or take the product uh okay uh, both questions are really interesting first one which, which deals about the safety data regarding the various options of menstrual hygiene products is something which we are looking uh, very actively because there is not enough data out there whether as nandita mentioned use of menstrual cups is there with the reusable uh, cloth napkins so all the options uh, and as and as government takes a very informed decision we can't always hurry so we need to take informed decision with proper data which is on our side so that it becomes a part and parcel of the government schemes and that means that you have to be careful what you are advising the states because government of india broadly is an advisory uh, capacity we create guidelines we work very closely with the states but then the final choice has to be the states and states always choose with evidence you know so if we can provide them evidence ki okay say like she said menstrual cup is good so but then is it good what are the condition with support menstrual cup what are the drawbacks of menstrual cup same thing with cloth napkins how how easy are they to access to use to dry to wash to maintain the hygiene with those reusable ones are the plain cloth napkins only better so that they use and they throw so they don't have to go back because they don't have private places to clean they don't have enough water they don't have the privacy they don't even have access to separate toilets so so what happens is that you have to look into various conditions while sitting in the government because the i think all of you know india is a huge country and what happens in uttar pradesh will not happen in kerala will not happen in rajasthan or west bengal or tripura so since it is very variable we have to give and as i think was mentioned we have to give a basket of choices to the states you know whatever suits their paradigm whatever suits their uh, system that is the option they should be there and that that's why i think the data will be wonderful for us and i'm i'm so pro it if anybody is going to do a proper study about the use of various menstrual hygiene options i'm all for it fine that is is a wonderful thing second is about the containment zone 
uh, see, I think a conscious decision is being taken by the government. What are the life-saving services which need to be carried out in the containment zone? Right, and uh, I would say, fine, menstrual hygiene is something which is cyclical, which will happen irrespective of pandemic, whatever is there. But it is not life-saving. It, it is very important for the woman's dignity, for her right to have uh, self-esteem. Everything is there. But it is not life saving as of now. Life saving is uh, as of now. Maybe we're looking at containment. Is we are we are setting up institution which are called COVID hospital, COVID daycare centers, COVID centers are there for patients who are suspect of of uh, COVID, right? But sanitary napkin availability is there in these institutions. So if in case any uh, lady, any man, I would say the husband. In fact, I think I would take a step back and say we need to train the husbands, the brothers, the men more than the women out there because women know what they have to use. You know, it is informing and involving the men in the house, which will be a large step. So, in fact, I would say that if anybody is looking at creation of IEC regarding menstrual hygiene, please create something which involves the men. How come all the IEC we get from our maybe a lot of our partners, a lot of our supporters is all about women talking about menstrual hygiene? So if the men are on board of menstrual hygiene, then I think this hesitation of actually accessing health services, say a woman has to go to a health institution to pick up a napkin in the containment zone, she will think twice, you know. So she will have to think of some other reason why she is going. So that kind of confidence, if a woman has to have that she can access healthcare services to ask for napkins which are already present, that kind of confidence we have to build in women's and containment zone. Yes, availability is there, but the access many times is, is an issue because of public transport, because of issue. How will the girl, how will the girl or the mother or the brother go to the institution to just pick up sanitary napkins? And secondly, saying a lot of shops, whether they are pharmacies or gen general stores also, are not really updating their supplies. They don't have access to latest if the sanitary napkins are there. In fact, there's an article in the paper which said that sanitary napkins are not available a lot of these shops in containment areas which is which is kind of shocking because that is something which is acceptable you know women uh, women or men spouses or brothers must be coming to shops to procure napkins for their sisters and mothers or girls themselves must be coming and the shopkeeper did not think of, of you know uploading his stock so this is the kind of apathy we are facing also in our in our own circles you know they don't really realize how important sanitary napkins are as a cyclical pattern every month every woman is going to menstruate so yes, it is it is involving a multi-pronged approach, right from accessing healthcare to increasing awareness in the general community as well. And of course, empowering our women and the brothers and fathers into being able to access sanitary napkins without having any stigma. They should not feel shy going and asking. So it is, I think it's kind of complicated, but yes, we have to reach there sometime. And okay. In fact, Zoya's point about men, um, can you take that forward, Prableen, and can you tell us how you think we can more effectively include men in our outreach and our awareness on MHM? Sure, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zoya, for uh, some very honest insights uh, of what really is, uh, can the governments do and where really the buck stops at the community. Uh, I think what is important in this conversation is is first to establish the fact that this is like i said it is not a women's issue so it is not shifting responsibility of women to realize which products they can use it is their right to choose from the basket of choices that they get equally it is not men's responsibility to feel more apathetic or sympathetic or empathetic towards this biological process because it's not it is true that not all women menstruate it is also true that menstruation is not is, is not a gendered concept. So it is important for us to recognize that men also can menstruate. Uh, and therefore it is a responsibility of a larger community uh, to decide whether it is the messaging that needs to change on breaking stigma or whether it is the actual availability. And I think it is by far what is important is that we need to tackle the structural discrimination that takes place in the society where whether it begins from gender it begins from age caste class uh sexual orientation or disability and at that point i feel that issues like menstruation are life-saving issues because imagine a woman who is walking and uh, miles to reach home without of a uh, without a menstrual uh, management product hygiene no hygiene is really way away of this uh, of of their lived realities in that concept, even if we have sensitive men around us, the whole refutal that has happened of her 
self autonomy and rights is completely the their lived reality at this point so it is important to shift this discourse of menstrual ma um, health management on how to manage but to actually talk about how to com to give complete control uh, on the, uh, on uh, menstruators body so that it is not the social conservatism that guides our programs that guides our communication material uh the second important thing that i would like to talk about is there have been several programs that have used different uh methodologies from sports to workshops to campaigns uh to even youth led advocacy platforms some of which even dr zoya has been a uh, part of uh, where uh, adolescents have actually directly spoken to uh, block and district level officers Uh, and asked for their entitlements and when we create those kind of affirmative and safe spaces for people to ask for their rights that is the first step for any kind of change which is more sustainable uh i think it is also important therefore to understand that it is perhaps an essential component but is highly overlooked uh that voices of young people and adolescents themselves uh to generate the demand of their needs uh and to speak to their health providers and to speak to the communities that they belong uh one very critical aspect in this that we always miss is we see adolescent in this most uh opposite ways right we ask them we the messaging that they get is you are growing up and therefore you have to be mature at the same time we tell them that there are certain issues which are private and therefore cannot be talked in public and you are not mature enough to discuss or to seek this kind of information or to take decisions i think we need to break this silo of pushing them into these really contradictory uh, life case scenarios the adolescent and young people deserve uh, the right to grow up uh, living healthier lives without the fear of discrimination and violence uh, on the basis of sex gender orientation or expression and we need to start steering conversations around them knowing their body and knowing their rights thank you very much uh, prabhin a uh, question for nidhi nidhi there in the management of menstrual health programs we don't see any or much representation of persons with disabilities how do you think that could be corrected and how do you think programs could be made more effective uh, by doing this um i think really for uh, thank you so much for that question i um i want to begin by saying that if you know organizations were working on mainstream menstrual health programs um the best place to start is probably having conversations with people with disabilities to understand how to integrate what are the needs and how to integrate them with disabilities in the programs right um so for example um just if we start sort of giving a range of products and say okay there are also menstrual cups available there are also these environmental friendly pads what do that really means for what does that really mean for someone with limited mobility um so really have conversations conducting focus groups testing giving test materials sort of you know if this works um uh, for particular groups with specific barriers so just for example right i'm think and, and understanding accessibility guidelines so i would say all of this having conversations understanding the needs and understanding keeping accessibility guidelines in mind for me why it's example is uh, it's important is i'll give you an example here um which is slightly away from menstruation um when we think of technology and and products right so thinking about the home kit the pregnancy testing kit um which is a Thank home you. kit if you imagine if you imagine there wouldn't be a a blind person or a blind woman would not be able to access that independently which means that her privacy security um many 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 things get compromised right so when we're talking about dignity privacy and security all three get compromised so just really thinking about these parameters as we design programs for other women and we really see women designing programs for women right and this is a very important thing to remember how would we feel about a bunch of if we had a committee to design menstrual health programs and there was not a single woman on that committee um it would be difficult so really to design program for women with disabilities if we include or even other women right sitting on the margins if we included them 
within the programming committees, if we included their needs, that would be helpful as a first step already. Hello. Thank you. Thank you very much yeah. for that, Nidhi. Um, one more question for Zoya. Um, Zoya, this is not so much about young people, but it's about women per se. And we've seen a lot uh, being written in the papers, not only in India, but other places as well, about how awkward and difficult it is for health service providers, doctors, as well as paramedic staff, who don't have access access to enough PPE and are not able to, um, you know, discard PPE, go to the uh, bathroom to change that. And some of the stories that have been enabling uh, doctors to swap duties when women doctors are uh, menstruating can they swap with a male, male, male doctors is this something that is being considered at all and if not is it something that can be brought to the attention of those people who are managing this uh, pandemic to, you know, you said very rightly that we are learning as we are going and issuing guidelines as we are going along. But the thing is that guidelines, by the time they trickle down to the ground, there's another set of guidelines that is required to be issued. The things have changed. So how can we, at least for this issue, which hits so close to home for women, how can we do something that is, you know, that will be valid for the next three or four months and make women make women's lives easier? Thank you. I think that is, uh, I think frankly speaking, that question, it doesn't really, uh, I really cannot comment very confidently on that question because I don't deal with COVID here at the ministry. So it will be, I think, uh, too uh, in, inappropriate for me to comment as to whether the government is looking at a policy for allowing women some kind of a relaxation in case they're having periods and not wear PPE because the PPE is very critical in, save, in actually keeping the healthcare provider safe. Then the, and, and the risk of the woman of actually going to the toilet to change a sanitary napkin and coming back, the PP is not really, again, as safe as it was in the morning. And the risk is too high, then I would say then they maybe need to take a call. The, the women doctors themselves have to take a call if there's no policy. I'm sorry, I really don't know if there's a policy, if any changes happening. But if I was a medical doctor and I was having these issues, then of course, because I think as you work in uh, with your uh, male co colleagues, or non-binary, maybe transgender doctors also. You have a, you form a very good bonding with your colleagues, you know, and they're always there to help. If this is an issue with the with the menstruating women in hospitals, then they can always exchange duties because I think during our clinical service, there was there was always for whatever reason, you know, and this is such a logical reason if the woman cannot change her sanitary napkins while wearing PPE, then she should change. I mean, if there is no policy per se, then I think uh, your male colleagues and the colleagues who are not menstruating are always there to help. It should not be a huge issue that uh, that there should be a policy for it that you know women who are menstruating should not actually wear PPEs or go to work. You have you're having a period to you exchange duties and you do some extra duties for somebody else who's taking your load off during these five days. That should not be a huge policy issue per se. I would say. Yeah, actually, it's a little unfair to ask you this question, Zoya, because you are not the one who's dealing with it, and we respect that. Just because it's come up in the discussions yeah. and you know in in the media these days. Maybe not a policy issue, but it is something that will pinch some women. And no, maybe there is, and you can bring it to the attention of others who are concerned with this to say that everything may not need a guideline or a policy, but it we can help in some way by clarifying things. Then is there is there the possibility of doing that? No, but tell me, Ina, if we talk, we start talking about these issues, you know, uh, right from menstruation, are we not adding the stigma to it? Okay, if a girl is having menstruation, she should not do duties. You know, 
So I think there's a lot of since there's a lot of coordination with your colleagues in hospital. There's so yeah. much of it on personal issues. You know, you don't have to issue guidelines for exchanging duties. You know, if you're yeah. having periods or whatever. You know, if you have other issues, say morning sickness. You know, if you if you're pregnant early, so that woman, that that lady doctor who's maybe having first trimester and she's vomiting a lot. So they always exchange with the colleagues. That has happened all our lives. We have seen. You know, so I don't think it should be something which will have some guidelines to work out. But I, yeah. but I don't know. <laughs> so, you know what I would also like to say that a lot of nurses are also women. I mean, it's not only the problem of the doctors. So that way, then we'll have to put everybody away. Yeah, there'll be so many women who will be menstruating at the same time. So what we have to give them is maybe long term. You know, they use a tampon plus a pad. So you have to yeah. educate them that for six to eight hours they should be able to maintain that. And if they have heavy periods, medication should be taken to prevent that. For heavy menstruation, anyway, they become anemic. So I think these are the ways in which we need to tackle this and not take them off duty. I think this is how I would uh, do it. As Soya says, it's very important because you're stigmatizing them again. And anyway, so many times I think as women doctors, you do face that. You know, a lot of your male colleagues become very cynical. Oh, now she's married. Then she'll get pregnant. Yeah. Then she start exchanging duties. Oh, she's having period. She's having dysmenorrhea. Now she change duties. You know. So the more you add importance to all these things, the more I yeah. think. Okay, I think that okay. we Topics. don't want to trivialize the issue. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Point taken. I I think we want to place. You know, the idea is to place on the table. That this is something that can make work a little complicated for many, many women who are in the health force, including frontline workers. Now, there may be ten solutions to it. There may be twenty solutions to it. Sometimes it's a matter for the head of institution to consider. Sometimes it's for individuals to resolve it themselves. Sometimes it is to be done with peers. But mm -hmm. I think that uh, flagging it. And finding ways to address it is important because we don't want to also just push everything under the carpet because it has to do with menstruation because it might stigmatize. No, in fact, it should be part of the normal conversation, and we should normalize these kinds of conversations. I think that's pretty much the point. And one of the participants here was emphasizing that this is something that affects even uh, Anganwadi workers and ANMs, yeah. which. Um, uh, who have to, you know, travel distances, don't have access to toilets. Actually, people need access to toilets irrespective of whether they are menstruating or not, but more so for this reason. Okay, we are pretty, we're one minute short of closure. So I'm not going to take any more questions. I'm just going to take this opportunity to thank our panelists, Zoya, Nidhi, Nandita, and uh, Prableen for their insights, for their openness, and for sharing their thoughts and views. It would have been actually nice to have another um, another half an hour to be able to speak more in depth on some of these and um, and and to find more ideas, more solutions as well. So uh, we leave it here. Thank you so much for and to the participants as well as to Mental Menstrual Health Alliance for initiating uh, these conversations. Um, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, Inaji. Thank you, everyone. We will leave the chat box on for another uh, five minutes in case you want to exchange emails, uh, share your comments. Um, but we will be getting back to everyone who has uh, given us the emails in the RSVP with resources from this discussion and from the discussions in the morning on waste management technologies as well as uh, on on-ground innovations for menstrual health uh, information and products. So we'll be sharing those resources. So if you've not RSVP, please do put in your email there so we can get those uh, resources to you along with the recordings for the webinars. Thank you so much, everyone. And belated happy MH day. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye, everyone.